So we've got two main types. First, simple secondary and chronic secondary insomnia. The other one is chronic primary. Secondary insomnia refers to insomnia with an apparent cause which can be traced and treated. The term primary means acausal, an advanced type of chronic insomnia, near impossible to cure. The subtypes are numerous, the most common are onset and maintenance. Maintenance issues imply frequent, short or prolonged awakenings and fragmented sleep, while onset insomnia is when a person struggles to fall asleep at the desired bedtime. It is characteristic of any amount of time spent in bed which led to irritation due to an inability to initiate sleep. For most, it's around 20 minutes onwards. By the end of this video, we will gather solid tactics to get rid of insomnia, whatever the type may be. If not, at least improve it. Fix your definition. Secondary insomnia is a symptom, not a condition. A manifestation of other underlying causes. Treat the roots and you heal the corrupted surface layer. Let's look at some of these. Paradoxical insomnia refers to people who sleep great but still think they're not getting enough, or to those who rationalize having slept quite well while the opposite is fact. It's sort of an inability to perceive your sleep, an unconscious miscalculation thereof. This doesn't mean you don't have insomnia, it's usually a sign that you do, but some people only have sleep state misperception, it's good to know the difference. Studies on placebo sleep demonstrated that people who sleep well but identify as bad sleepers will go through increased daytime fatigue. On the other hand, those who sleep poorly identify themselves as good sleepers regardless. During the day, experience no lack of energy whatsoever. Weird, isn't it? To feel great, you don't have to sleep well, you just have to believe you do. From there you won't underperform during the day despite your insomnia. Likewise, believe you're a bad sleeper and whatever you conceive you can achieve. Stop identifying as an insomniac. Quit walking around telling people how you stayed up all night and struggle. Even if that is the case, fake it. Half of it is tricking your brain into belief. The other half is to regularly remind yourself of the time when you were once able to fall asleep quite naturally. It might be years ever since, but the memories are there, look for them. When insomniacs get an occasional good night of sleep, they'd think it doesn't count, only consider the bad nights. Well, from now on, focus on what's gonna get you ahead. Cultivate a non-counterproductive sleep identity. I'd like to go back and clarify on the previous concept by saying that I do not recommend you quit sleeping altogether and just believe that you do. That would be considered deliberate sleep deprivation. Insomnia is not sleep deprivation. If you don't have it or struggle with other sleep related problems like apnea, tricking your brain is gonna do more harm than good in the long run. Remember that this video is primarily directed to people with insomnia. Sleep specialist Michael Thorpe, his post on New York Times blog titled Can You Die of Insomnia denoted that sleep deprivation is dissimilar from insomnia, as on that chronic insomnia will not lead to death, and the serious medical conditions that come with sleep deprivation which I've discussed in my previous video are not in the slightest correlated with nor caused by insomnia. It is a separate condition on its own. Understanding the difference is key to beat all your delusional insomnia related fears, which is crucial in order to recover. Sleep doctors will tell you that the real definition of insomnia is not not sleeping, but caring a lot, and I mean a lot, about getting enough sleep. And it worsens the chronic parallel to the degree of this obsession. Doctors have no diagnosis, it is the patient who decides whether or not he has insomnia, because the specialist understands how a big part of it is all in the head. Realize that it isn't harmful in any way to lie down and have trouble sleeping. Take the anxiety component out of the equation. Quit obsessing over establishing the perfect sleep schedule, especially if you've been trying for months now. See what happens when you let go of it all. Try not to try. Neuroscientist Gilbert Hofer Tingley, along with other studies, depicted how lying in bed, resting without sleeping, is not wasted time. It has the same refreshing effect as sleep on some cognitive abilities. More permission for you to stop worrying. It can be related to racing thoughts and worries about what happened, about the day ahead. Try meditation, massage or implement something called pastime in your schedule. Many people from the hustle your face off nation have no time off. While some people can, working 24-7 may not be suitable for you. The stress accumulates and may lead to sleep issues. 
Along these lines, any mental or mood disorder like OCD, bipolar, BPD, clinical depression can also be one of the contributing factors. The mental illness per se is stressful to manage, add on to that the antidepressants needed would certainly have an effect on your sleep. Not saying you should stop consuming them, you should, I guess, but don't take your illness as an excuse, this is the idea. Still try out the tips I share in this video. Should you not suffer from any such disorder, simply leaving an unhealthy relationship or confronting someone in a crucial conversation like asking for a raise can rid you of your sleep-related anxiety. If you have trouble dozing off due to some apparent back pain or injury, you really need not consult a sleep doctor, the trigger is way too obvious. Treat your physical pain first and foremost, didn't work, then look to other causes. I'm not gonna repeat myself on this one, quit smoking and drinking. These stimulants are sleep disruptors by nature. Alcohol prompts peeing and frequent awakenings, the latter being characteristic to sleep maintenance insomnia. Also worsens apneas, choking and snoring. Works as a sedative, yes, helps you lose consciousness and fall asleep quickly, but doesn't necessarily contribute to more sleep or better performance the next day. Tom Roth demonstrated in a study how caffeine, chocolate and certain types of tea consumed 6 hours before sleep reduced sleep duration by 1 hour. This might not be that big of a deal, but for an insomniac you may need to consider every advice on the book and fingers crossed something works. In regards to drinks, switch to chamomile tea or passion flower tea with some added honey. These herbs are sleep promoting, even honey by itself can do the trick. Now concerning food, according to the National Sleep Foundation, it is preferable to eat nothing 2-3 to three hours before sleep time. Most food, especially a meal full of protein, can lead to insomnia when eaten near bedtime, due to the induced indigestion and worsened gastroesophageal reflux disease. In addition, you may want to choose your dinner very carefully. Chin Moi Cho had shown in his research how a carbohydrate-based high glycemic index meal can result in a shortening of sleep onset, compared to a carbohydrate-based low glycemic index meal, provided it's consumed around 4 hours before bedtime. In non-technical terms, your dinner should be based on unprocessed carbohydrates like whole grains, fruits and veggies and beans. Take into account your allergies before going on this type of diet. Now, if you got really hungry afterwards, limit yourself to dried fruits, cereal or bananas. These snacks are okay to consume near bedtime. Carbohydrate charged which promotes sleepiness. You could also eat foods rich in tryptophan or magnesium which increase melatonin release like chickpeas, almonds, walnuts, tart cherries and kale. Avoid proteins and activities which trigger dopamine, a neurotransmitter that fosters wakefulness. Speaking of light exposure, we've got the one before bedtime and during sleep. Charles Saisler studied individuals who use e-readers near sleep time and conveyed how they often have trouble dozing off in less REM sleep than people who read printed books and use no light emitting gadgets. If using your laptop is a must at night, try apps like Flux and Dimmer on smartphones or get a set of Uvex blue blocker glasses. All these are quite handy whenever you can't escape artificial light in the evening. They limit the radiated amount which fosters melatonin release afterwards. Preferably, stop using any light emitting device around 2 hours prior to sleep. I usually have to work a bit late so I use Flux in an hour before I turn off my computer. And I don't have a smartphone, yes I am the only weirdo on the planet who doesn't fortunately. Last phone I bought was around two, 2009 or 2010. When you have no portable digital stimulant in hand, the induced boredom can help you fall asleep. Quick side note, choose the height and type of your pillow based on your own comfort, same goes for your bed. Remember that you have to be comfortable in order to sleep. Some sleep doctors advise sleeping with many pillows to raise comfort level. And pick your sheets and blankets based on how much sweaty or cold you get later in the night. Now let exposure during sleep. The faintest light is gonna screw up your melatonin level, so literally eradicate the last bit of light coming in and from your bedroom. At least do your best to reduce it, get yourself an eye mask. I've recently duct taped these large black garbage bags on my windows. Doesn't look great, sounds stupid, but perfect for blocking light. Highly recommended for people who work night shifts and sleep in the morning. Throw away your digital alarm clock, you don't need to know what time it is at 3 in the morning. Use your phone on silent mode as an alarm, place it away from your body. 
some people have this uncanny ability where they could wake up on time without an alarm. You may want to look into that as well. If your neighbor really has to rehearse his guitar at 2 a.m. in the morning, buy him a set of headphones or shoot him in the head. Just kidding, don't do that. Like I can't emphasize this enough, zero disturbances are a must to fall asleep, especially in your case with insomnia. Change rooms, sleep in the backyard, in the kitchen, in your dog house, on the roof, just kill the headaches. Now this doesn't mean divorce your spouse for snoring, simply encourage them to get professional help. In the meantime, you could buy earplugs. And as a side note, snoring and sleep apnea are serious conditions that induce poor sleep and heart problems in the long run. Treat them as soon as possible. Sleeping in or exposure to green places accounts for better sleep quality and improves insomnia-related depression, according to a 2015 preventive medicine study. In Medical Medium by Anthony William, meditating in nature is listed as a cure for mystery illnesses. Its effects on health is much like fruits and vegetables. These sleep hygiene tips are dedicated to prime the body for sleep and raise the comfort level of your bedroom. They're vital to implement as an insomniac. I myself have no insomnia, but I do confirm firsthand that they've improved my sleep quite drastically. Discard the old myth that more sleep is better than less sleep. Both are equally devastating. Whether or not you have insomnia, sleep restriction therapy is designed to help you find out how much sleep your body needs precisely. Say it's 6 hours. Undersleeping or oversleeping past this threshold could be the origin of all your sleep problems and daytime fatigue. SRT, realigning your internal clock. Here's how it works. First, figure out when you get tired exactly. If your bedtime is around 11 p.m. and you've noticed you can only fall asleep around 1 a.m. despite going to bed at 11 p.m., switch your bedtime to 1 a.m. Then set your alarm at 6.30 a.m. Don't snooze. Go by the schedule for a couple days. If you didn't experience sleepiness throughout the day, that means at this point in your life you only need five and a half hours of sleep, which is pretty rare. If you did, however, decrease your bedtime by 15 minutes, that would be 12.45 instead of 1 a.m. Give it a try. Still dog tired? Continue turning down your bedtime knob 15 minutes at a time until all signs of fatigue subside completely. The crucial thing is to keep your wake time the same, only modify bedtime. And remember that deliberate exhaustion of the body is what makes SRT an effective therapy. So try to avoid napping, regardless of feeling like crap. SRT trains the body to sleep not when it wants, but whenever you want. Frankly, I tried this and had to quit on the fourth day for I couldn't bear the tiredness it had prevented me from working on the channel. Anyhow, even after as little as four days, I attest to its effectiveness. The exhaustion component of the technique eliminated the small problems I had with sleep onset. Now I fall asleep almost immediately at my desired bedtime. Should you be insomniac, I'd suggest you stick to this for a whole month to see what happens. Primary chronic, no apparent cause whatsoever. Patients with this type are considered doomed and helpless. Their speculation is to be traced back to genes or an inability for the brain to produce necessary sleep hormones. Focus on what you can control, mindset change, full acceptance, sleep hygiene, and in spite of it being a serious condition, it seems to help keep the patient wide awake, has more time in turn to do other things in comparison to people who can and need to sleep. The obstacle is the way, as Ryan Holiday puts it. Primary insomnia is incurable, but who knows, really. If sleep science has come only this far, doesn't mean you should lose hope. Keep investigating the causes, try alternative medicine, and further educate yourself about sleep. To know whether or not you have primary insomnia, please check out the official DSM-4 diagnostic criteria, which I'll leave in the description below. Beware now that you've got a new set of tactics in your arsenal. You might turn that obsession towards establishing perfect sleep hygiene or doing the best SRT challenge. Don't. Realize that everyone experiences insomnia every now and then. It's normal. Why it's stuck with you, in particular, is because you made a big deal out of it. Whether you think you have simple secondary, chronic secondary or primary insomnia, try all the tips I've shared with you today. Sleep hygiene, per se, can work for some. Others need a better mindset, SRT, cutting down on nicotine, caffeine, and so on. Do try them all out, but ensure to start with sleep hygiene. Moreover, I found that joining a martial arts class with an intensive training routine overexhausts the body to a point where falling asleep is inevitable. Likewise, you're free to experiment and come up with your own tactics. 
thanks for watching guys. For now I try to post a video once every two weeks, so if you like the journey self-help and educational content, make sure to subscribe and stay updated. Until next time.